All right, guys, good evening and welcome to our next lecture. We are going to be talking about vital signs. So let's jump on in and learn about vital signs. So what are our learning objectives? So our learning objectives after we go through this PowerPoint presentation is that you guys will be able to identify the measurements that constitute vital signs. You will be able to state why they are called vital signs and you're going to be able to describe the relationship among the vital signs. You will be able to give examples of reasons for changes in body temperature and describe the related physiology. You will be able to state normal adult body temperature as measures in four different area, body areas and you will be able to differentiate among the terms febrile, afebrile, intermittent and remittent fever, crisis and lysis. And in the skills lab, you are gonna be able to demonstrate the ability to measure body temperature by the various methods and with the various equipment discussed in the chapter. Um, you will also in the lab be able to demonstrate the ability to measure and describe radial apical and apical radial pulses. In the skills lab, you will be able to demonstrate the ability to count and describe respirations. In the skills lab, you will be able to demonstrate the ability to accurately measure blood pressure and orthostatic blood pressure using the arm cuff and thigh cuff and use the um, aneroid manometer and the electronic monitor. And lastly, you will be able to state the normal adult pulse rate, respiration rate, and blood pressure ranges. So we have a lot to learn. So again, with every other thing that we're going to learn in nursing, there's always some terminology that goes along with it. Some of it you may know, some of it you may not. Remember earlier I said it's important that you know these terms and know how to use them because you need to be able to talk like a nurse, right? Think like a nurse, talk like a nurse. So some of the new terminology that you're going to be using for vital signs is apical pulse, apical radial pulse, apnea, auscultation, axillary, bradycardia, bradypnea, carotid pulse, Celsius, Cheyenne strokes, strokes, respirations, crisis, cyanosis, diastole, dyspnea, eupnea, Fahrenheit, femoral pulse, fever, systole, tachycardia, tachypnea, temporal, and tympanic. And actually this is spelled incorrectly. So there we go, I just fixed that for you, sorry. And then we have hand sanitation, um, hypertension, hypotension, quarter cough sounds, Kussmaul's respirations, lysis, oral, orthopnea, palpation, pedal pulse, popliteal pulse, pulse, pulse pressure, radial pulse, rectal, sphygmomanometer. I always, that one always gets me. Um, steroidous breathing and stethoscope. And you can find these terminologies in the front of your book if you want to look them up and they will give you some definitions. So what do we need? A little grocery list. What do we need and able to, to be able to assess vital signs in a patient? Well, we need a stethoscope. We will use the stethoscope when we're listening to breath sounds and when we're listening to heart sounds. We need a wristwatch so that way we can have um, a watch with a second hand on it so that we can count our respirations and our um, heart sounds. We need a thermometer so we can measure temperature. You're going to need a pen so that you can write down all your vitals, paper to write your vitals on, and then lastly you're going to need a blood pressure cuff. All right, so what's included in vital signs? What are we checking for when we get a set of vital signs? So vital signs are indicators of physiologic functioning and they reflect the health status of a patient. Vital signs include a person's temperature, their pulse, their respiration, and blood pressure. Um, pain assessment is often included along with the measurement of vital sounds. It's considered the fifth vital sign. And then pulse oximetry is 
the it's a non-invasive measurement of the arterial um, oxyhemoglobin saturation. So it also is often included with the measurement of the vital signs. So you're always going to want to check heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, respirations, temperatures, and pain. So when do we actually assess a patient's vital signs? How do we know when we want to do it? So whenever a patient is admitted to a unit or admitted to any kind of healthcare agency, you always want to get a baseline set of vitals. So if, a, if we're talking in the hospital setting, if a patient comes into the hospital and they go into the ER, as soon as they get into the ER, they're going to have their vitals monitored, okay? Then if they get admitted and they go up to the floor, they're going to get their um, vitals monitored as soon as they enter the floor where they're going to be staying. Then we can also monitor them based on agents, uh, your agency's institutional policies and procedures. So where I work um, on my floor, if it's just a regular med surge floor, we do vitals um, when they first come to the floor. Then we do vitals every four hours for the first 24 hours. Then after the first 24 hours, we do them at six o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the afternoon, and then 10 o'clock at night. So that is based on your um, the institutional policy where you work. You are also going to assess vital signs whenever there's a change in a patient's condition. So if we just did vital signs on Mrs. Jones at six o'clock in the morning, but then around eight o'clock, she calls out and says, um, I'm not feeling very well. I'm having chest pain and I'm having difficulty breathing. If we think something's going on, we're going to do another set of vital signs because our vital signs are key to telling us what's going on with our patient. Okay. We're gonna do it before and after surgical or invasive diagnostic procedures. So if a patient comes in and they're gonna have a knee replacement, they're gonna have vitals beforehand, during the surgical process, and then after it. Um, you will do it before and after an activity that may increase your risk. So if patients are um, working with, if they're in the hospital and they're working with physical therapy or occupational therapy and they're walking them around, they always do a set of vitals beforehand to make sure they're stable first. And then they do a set of vitals afterwards to make sure that they are um, within normal range after they did all their activity. And then we have before administering medications that affect cardiovascular or respiratory monitoring. So examples of this may be um, if I'm gonna do my morning med pass with my patients and I have heart, high blood pressure medicines or medicines that regulate the heart rate if they have an irregular heart rate or any kind of pain medicine or anything that's going to influence their volume, um, their circulating volume, I want to make sure I assess vitals first to make sure that they're stable before I give them the medication. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about, whoops, is body temperature. So our body temperature is simply the difference between the amount of heat produced by our body and the amount of heat that is lost to the environment when we measure that in degrees, okay? Very simple. How much our body produces with um, how much heat is lost to our environment. So heat is generated in our bodies through a metabolic process, it occurs deep down in the core tissues of our bodies. Um, the heat is then transferred to the skin surface by the circulating blood, and then it's displaced into the environment, into the environment. So that is how we lose our heat through our skin and into the environment. Um, our core body temperature, okay, like I said earlier, it's down way deep down in the tissues of our body, is actually higher than our surface body temperature, so our skin temperature. So surface temperature is our skin, our subcutaneous tissue, and our fat. Um, normal body temperatures range from 35.9 to 38 degrees Celsius, which correlates in terms of Fahrenheit, it would be 96.7 to 100.5, depending on the route that you use for measurement. So in the nursing world, we do everything in Celsius. Um, so whenever you have to put your um, information in the computer, you always want to make sure that it's in Celsius. So we are actually going to learn um, during this lecture how to calculate that. All right, so how do we 
measure temperature. So we can do it orally. Oral temperature is accurate and it's convenient. Um, you need to make sure though that your patient is appropriate to have an oral um, temperature taken. So are they alert? Can they close his or her mouth around the probe? This is not a suitable method for young small children because they have a hard time um, keeping their mouth closed and paying attention to what you're doing. It's not appropriate for patients who are developmentally delayed, patients who are unable to follow directions, if they're confused, or of course, if they're comatose. Um, if your patient just had something hot or cold to drink, you would wanna wait about 15 or 30 minutes and then um, check the temperature because if not, you will get an, Ill, um, an irregular reading. So to take an oral temperature, we gently place the thermometer with an oral probe under the tongue in the posterior sublingual pocket, which is lateral to the lower jaw. Um, the oral sublingual site has a lot of rich blood supply um, that comes from the carotid artery, so it quickly responds to changes um, in inner core temperature. Normal oral temperature is resting in a resting person is 37 degrees Celsius, which correlates to 98.6 in Fahrenheit. And you can have a range of between 35.8 degrees Celsius to 37.3 degrees Celsius, which correlates to 96.4 to 99.1 Fahrenheit. Um, you can also do a rectal temperature. What you would want to do is you want to uh, help assist the patient into the SIMS position, which is they're laying on their left hand side, in case you guys don't know what that position is, um, with their upper leg kind of flexed. You would wear gloves. You would want to um, expose the anal area while making sure that you provide privacy and respect their dignity and you keep other body parts covered. You would just want to spread their buttocks apart to expose the anal opening and then you would put some lubricant on your thermometer and then you would insert it in there. Now rectal temperatures take a little bit longer okay, to, um, to come up to where you find out what your degree is and they actually tend to be a little bit higher. So you have to know which type of temperatures you can take, but you also have to know which type of temperatures um, result in a higher temperature. So rectal temperatures are usually about 0.7 to 1 degree Fahrenheit higher than oral temperatures, and that's 0.4 to 0 0.5 degrees in Celsius. Okay. All right, so factors that affect body temperature. There's a lot of factors that can affect your body temperature. Um, so both the very old and the very young are much more sensitive to changes in environmental temperature. So your infants and your young children, they have less effective heat they have a less effective heat control mechanism and newborns have such a large surface to mass ratio that they lose heat very rapidly to the environment, okay? So their temperatures can hover between 36.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius. Older adults, um, they have a lower um, mean of temperature around 36.2, 97.1 Fahrenheit. They experience a lot of subcutaneous fat loss as they get older. So older adults at more, are at more of a risk for harm from extreme temperatures due to that impaired thermoregulatory response. Your circadian rhythm, um, which is predictable fluctuations in measurements of body temperature and blood pressure, are examples of functions that have a circadian rhythm. So your body temperature is usually about 0 0.6 degrees Celsius, lower in the early morning than in the late afternoon and early evening. And this variation tends to be somewhat greater. You'll see in infants and children. And then the peak elevation of a person's temperature usually occurs between 4 and 8 p.m. And it's usually 1 to 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit um, higher of the lowest in the morning hours, and then the peak occurring in the later afternoon or early evening. Our hormones can also have a, um, an effect on our blood pressure. So as progesterone rises and ovulation, um, you know, is there's secretion when you're ovulating, it rises your, it can raise your temperature from 0 0.5 to one degrees Fahrenheit. Stress can cause our temperatures to rise. 
our environment has a huge impact on our body temperature. Most of us respond to changes in the environment temperature by wearing clothing that either allows increase in heat loss when it's hot or retained heat when it's cold. And there is a table that you guys can take a look at, two tables, 25.1 and 25.2. You have age-related variations in normal vital signs on page 645 and mechanisms of heat transfer, page 647. I recommend that you guys take a look at that as it has some more information on there that's very helpful. So alterations in body temperature. So we can have hyperthermia. So hyperthermia is high body temperature, also known as fever or pyrexia. So a person with a fever is said to be febrile. So if you're giving report to your patient and, I mean, if you're giving report to the, to the nurse in the morning and you wanna tell them that your patient had a fever overnight, you'll say Mrs. Jones was febrile overnight. Her temperature was blah, 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 blah. A fever is an inflammatory response that extends beyond the site of infection and it affects the entire body. It results in an overall increase in body temperature Body temperature is normally regulated and maintained by the hypothalamus, okay? It's an anatomical section of the brain, and the main function is to maintain homeostasis in the body. However, certain bacteria or viral infections can result in the production of what we call pyrogens, um, chemicals that effectively alter the body's thermostat setting, okay? Those bacteria, they're called pyrogens and they affect the thermostat setting of the hypothalamus to elevate the body temperature, thus causing a fever, okay? So fevers can also be caused by exercise. If your patient is dehydrated, um, myocardial infarctions, which are heart attacks, pulmonary embolisms, which are blood clots that have traveled, um, certain cancers, certain tumors cause um, what we call a tumor fever, and then traumas and some surgeries can also result in fevers. So the, pyrog the pyrogens that we talked about, okay, that are caused by these bacterial or viral infections, they act on the hypothalamus, which we said is the body's thermostat, and it resets it to a higher temperature. And in doing so, when this process happens, it invokes the body temperature's raising mechanisms and raising the body temperature to a level above what we think is normal. So the body has several techniques to raise its temperature. First one is shivering, so which involves physical movement that produces heat. So that physical movement that you're getting from shivering when you have that fever is promoting heat, okay? vasoconstriction. So vasoconstriction entails the constriction of all the blood flow beneath the skin, and it reduces the amount of heat loss from the body. So instead of getting it out to all the organs and circulating as much as it normally would, it's kind of keeping it there because you don't want to, they, they're trying to avoid loss of heat. And when the new elevated set point is reached, your heat production balances out, the shivering stops, you usually start sweating, I um, think every one of us that has ever had a fever knows how that happens. You stop sweating, you, I mean, you start shivering, you stop shivering, and then you start sweating, and then your temperature goes down. Um, patients with a fever, um, their vital signs are going to dictate that they have a fever, so they're going to have an elevated heart rate, and they're going to have an increased respiratory rate. So we refer to an increased heart rate as tachycardia, nursing words, and we refer to an increased respiratory rate as tachypnea. These fevers will cause an increase in thirst and shivering, we said that. So what are we gonna do to treat a fever? We're gonna give them antipyretics, which are your aspirin, acetaminophen, and ibuprofen. We're gonna give them fluid and rest because they're gonna be hydrated. And we wanna minimize their activity so their body can rest. You can also cool down the skin with some um, sponge baths, we even have cooling blankets that you can use and some cold packs. Okay, so alternative in body temperature hypothermia. So we just talked about hyperthermia, which is an increase in body temperature. So hypothermia has to be a decrease in body temperature. So hypothermia is a body temperature below the lower limit of normal. It occurs when the compensatory physiologic responses meant to produce and retain heat are overwhelmed by unprotected exposure to cold environments. 
So what causes um, hypothermia? Chronic conditions such as alcoholism, malnutrition, hyperthyroidism, um, increase the risk of hypothermia. Patients in perioperative periods and newborn infants are also at an increased risk. Death can occur when the body temperature falls below 35 degrees Celsius, which is 95 degrees Fahrenheit. But survival um, has been reported in isolated cases, mainly in cases like drowning in very cold water or being buried in the snow, because when body temperatures have fallen in the range of severe hyperthermia, the survival is possible because rates of chemical reactions that are occurring in the body are slowed down. So it decreases the metabolic demands in the body for oxygen. Um, we even use therapeutic hypothermia in, in the hospital setting. We induce it in patients, patients that have had um, cardiac arrest and heart attacks. The decrease in the body temperature reduces the metabolic rate and the oxygen demand of the body, and it helps improve the survival and neurological outcomes. So what will air assessment findings look like if we were experiencing hypothermia? So if our pulse and our respirations were increased with hyperthermia, what do you think they would be for hypothermia? They're going to be the complete opposite. You're going to have, excuse me, decreased pulse and decreased respiration. So decreased pulse, we call um, bradypnea, and decreased respirations, we call, we call bradycardia. And we do um, say that um, hypothermia is a body temperature less than 35 degrees Celsius and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Hypotension, we're gonna have low blood pressure. Um, we're gonna have decreased urinary output. You're gonna be disoriented. The color of your skin will be pale. Your skin will be cold. Um, you might have frostbite. Drowsiness, progressing to a coma is something that you might see. And then chronic conditions that increase that risk. Well, we said that earlier. Alcoholism, malnutrition, and hyperthyroidism. So assessing the body temperature. If we do oral, we're gonna wait 30 minutes if the client has consumed hot or cold food, okay, um, recently. And then when we document it, we're gonna make sure that we document it um, PO, which means oral. So when you document your um, temperature in your charting system at the hospital, it's gonna give you a couple different options. You're gonna put in the, the degrees that you got, and then it wants to know, was it axillary, was it PO, meaning oral, was it um, rectal, how did you get this temperature? So it's always important to say how you got it. And then like we said earlier, if you are gonna do a rectal temperature, you're gonna have that patient on their left side, okay? Left lateral, Sims position with that right leg up. Um, you're gonna use lubricant. This is something you're gonna wanna imply, your, you're gonna wanna implement your standard precautions with, right? You're gonna wear gloves because we might come in touch with body fluids. Um, and then when you document these findings, you're going to document an R because R means for rectal. You do have to keep in mind that there is a higher um, degree when you do the rectal route. So you're going to want to remember that. And then you are going to insert it about one and a half inches. It doesn't have to go that far. And like I said, it does take a little bit more time, sometimes two to four minutes before you get that temperature to show up. So those are things just to keep in mind. All right, so more areas where we can assess temperature. So we can do axillary, and axillary is just under the arm. You're gonna place that thermometer with an oral probe over top of it in the cl client's clean, dry axillary area. You wanna make sure it's not wet or sweating. Um, you're gonna lower the arm over the probe and then hold it there until you get your reading. Um, you can use this method for newborns and for clients that are having oral surgery, or I gave you some examples of clients that maybe if they were um, mentally challenged in any way, or they weren't able to close their mouth, or if they weren't um, completely alert and oriented, this would be a good option for them. And then you would want to document after you got your findings an AX for axillary in your computer system. Then we can do temporal. We don't usually do these in the hospital. 
um, but this is an option. So while pressing the scan button on the temporal thermometer, you would want to hold that probe completely flat against the forehead and you're going to move it gently across the forehead over the temporal artery and then you're going to touch the skin right behind the earlobe. You would just release the scan button to display the temperature reading. Um, like I said, it's quick, it's great for children, but we don't usually use these in the adult setting um, in the hospital. They might use them in the pediatric setting, but I don't really um, go there to work, so I'm not too sure about that. And then we have the tympanic membrane. So it's measured body temperature, just like all the other ones. Um, if the patient has a lot of earwax in their ears, it might affect the reading, it might not be accurate. So what you would wanna do is you're gonna pull the pinna of the ear, which is your little earlobe, up, I'm not your earlobe, up, you're gonna, the top of the ear up and back on adults, okay? So pull the pinna straight back and down in infants. Um, place the thermometer probe snugly into the client's outer ear canal and then press the scan button. There is less risk of cross-contamination with this because the inner ear is lined with skin and not mucous membrane but it's not as used as frequently, unfortunately. I feel like these were really popular a lot of, a long time ago. Um, and they're still popular. I have one actually for when my grandkids come over because it's easier for them, but we, def we don't use these in the hospital setting either. So how do we convert a temperature from Celsius to Fahrenheit? So Celsius, the, the formula is Celsius equals your Fahrenheit degrees minus 32, okay? So pretty simple. Celsius, your Fahrenheit degree minus 32. This is the equation right here. Um, we will go over this. We're gonna have, um, we're gonna work on these together when we have our actual lecture and we're gonna practice doing some of these. And then for our, if we wanna convert the opposite way, if we wanna convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit equals Celsius times nine over five, which is really 1.8 plus 32, okay? So if your um, Celsius degree was 40, okay, you would want to multiply it by 1.8, Actually, that has a minus sign, that's wrong. You would wanna multiply it by 1.8 and then add 32 to it. So that would be 72 plus 32, which equals 104. So these are the ones we're gonna practice once we get into our actual live lectures in a couple weeks. So these are the normal temperatures for healthy adults. So oral is 37.0 Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Rectal temperatures, 37.5 degrees Celsius, 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Axillary, 36.5 degrees Celsius, 97.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you have tympanic, which is 37.5 degrees Celsius, 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And temporal, which is 37 degrees Celsius and 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So variations in normal temperatures by age. So newborns will be um, axillary around 36.8 to 98.2. A year old, same thing, 36.8, 98.2 axillary. Children five to eight years old are about 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And then it's gonna be the same for teens, adults, and elders greater than 70. All right, so now we are gonna move on to our pulses. So the peripheral pulse is a throbbing sensation that can be palpated. Another word for palpated is felt, but palpated is our nursing language. So a, sense, a throbbing sensation that can be palpated over a peripheral artery, such as the radial artery or the carotid artery. Peripheral pulses result from a wave of blood being pumped into the arterial circulation by the contraction of the left ventricle in the heart. Um, you can assess these pulses in the foot, the wrist, 
the neck and even behind the knee. So our apical pulse, which is found at the apex of the heart, okay, to find the apex of the heart, and you guys are going to learn more about this when you do your um, physical assessment, you're going to palpate the space between the fifth and sixth rib um, and the fifth intercostal space, and then you would move down to the left mid-clavicular line. I know that sounds like a lot right now, but it'll make sense to you in a couple weeks when you do physical assessment. You want to place the diagram over the apex of the heart, okay? And then you will hear um, your heart sounds. The pulse is a wave-like sensation or an impulse that you feel in peripheral arter arterial vessels. Um, and over the apex of the heart is, is a gauge of cardiovascular status. In a healthy person, the peripheral and apical pulse should be the same. Um, the rate that we talk about when we feel our pulse is the number of times per minute that you feel or hear the pulse. So that's our rate, the number of times we feel it or hear the rate. So just some pulse physiological information. So the pulse is regulated by the autotomic nervous system through the SA node in the heart, right, which is the pacemaker of the heart. Parasympathetic stimulation of that SA node via the vagus nerve decreases the heart rate and sympathetic stimulation of the SA node. So going back to that biology, that anatomy and physiology, you guys should remember all about the parasympathetic stimulation and that um, sinoatrial node. So it increases the heart rate, okay? The parasympathetic stimulation increases the heart rate and the force of the contraction of the heart. So the amount of blood that's coming out when the um, heart is contracted. If you want to have additional, if you want to see additional information about the conduction system and kind of get like a little review, there is one in chapter 39. So the pulse rate is the number of pulsations felt over a peripheral artery or heard over the apex of the heart in one minute. And this rate usually corresponds at the same rate when the heart is beating in a healthy person. So pulse sites. So we can, um, this is a little sh chart right here that shows you where all the sites are that you can palpate. So the carotid, the carotid artery is what we use when patients are um, in cardiac arrest. That's where we feel to see if we can feel a pulse. Um, in a person that's not in cardiac arrest, if you are assessing the carotid artery, you do not want to assess both sides at one time. If you do that, you will include the blood flow to the brain and the patient will pass out. So you only want to do one side, at a one side at a time. Then you have your apical pulse, which is the point of maximum intensity. You want to listen there for one full minute. And the count, um, we want to, the times that we do these are when we're given cardiac medications and we want to be extremely accurate on our, um, on our rate. We can use the brachial. Um, site, which is what we use when we're doing blood pressure. We can use radial blood, we can use radial pulses on the left and the right arm. Um, and a pulse deficit. So sometimes you will have a pulse deficit between the apical rate that you hear at the heart there and the radial rate. To be accurate and make sure that there is a difference, you should have two clinicians measure the apical and the radial pulses simultaneously, okay, if there is a pulse deficit. You want to make sure that what you're hearing really is a pulse deficit, so always have somebody else take a listen. So pulse assessment. So we said we're going to do a palpitation, I mean, yep, palpation. Um, if we're going to do it on our wrists, we are going to use our middle finger and our index finger and we're gonna do it right over the thumb there where the radial artery is, okay? We wanna use those two distal pads, one, two, the three fingers. I usually use two, that index finger and the middle, fin the middle finger. You're gonna use moderate pressure, okay? You don't wanna to push too hard because if you do, you can occlude the vein and then you won't feel it. So this is a little bit of a science. It takes some work and then some practice to where you know where to put your hand. And sometimes it's not in the same place on every single patient. It's in that general area but they're not always easy to find and they're not always in the same exact place. So it does take a little bit of practice. So you apply moderate pressure. You make sure that you have the client in a comfortable position. You don't want them to be uncomfortable. Make sure that their hand is resting down and relaxed. You don't want them to be holding it up. And then you count for 30 seconds. 
after your 30 seconds is up, this is why you need that watch with the second hand, right? You're gonna count for 30 seconds and then whatever that number is, you're gonna multiply times two. That's gonna be what you get in a minute. Um, and then you're gonna compare sides. So you wanna compare the left side with the right side. Is it the same? Does it feel the same? Do we have the same amount of um, you know, pressure on both sides? Am I getting the same numbers? If you cannot um, palpate, a pressure, I mean, um, a pulse in the hands or the feet, you can always use a Doppler. And um, you can apply gel to the hand or wherever you're trying to get your blood pressure from. And you use um, ultrasonic gel and it's a little Doppler and you'll learn this in clinical and then it'll pick up that pulse if there is one. Patients that have edema and things like that, you have to, um, sometimes get a Doppler if they're too swollen and you can't palpate them. So another way of um, assessing a pulse is we're gonna do an auscultation, okay? So you would use the diaphragm of the stethoscope. So if you look at this little um, diaphragm here, diagram here of the stethoscope, you will see the bell and the drum one there, and then you'll see the diaphragm. So that's the biggest part of the stethoscope that's flat. That's what you're gonna put over your heart that, that um, to get that apical pulse in the apex of the um, chest right there. And then you always wanna make sure before you put your stethoscope on the patient that you warm it with your hands because it can be pretty cold. So how do we describe a pulse when we feel one? So if you go to feel a pulse in your patient and you don't feel one in your documentation in the computer, you would give it a zero as absent or unable to palpate. If you feel it and it's weak, then you would think and it feels kind of diminished, then you would give it a plus one. If it's brisk and expected, that's a normal pulse, and we would give that a plus two. So a normal is always a plus two. And then if it's bounding, it's really, you know, you barely have to touch it and you can feel it and it's very strong, that would be a plus three. Okay, so more on pulse assessment. So pulse rhythm, so the pattern of, the pulse rhythm is, the pattern of beats and the interval between the beats. And we describe what we feel and hear as regular or irregular. So if you had your hands on the pulse, you would feel, you would feel in a normal person that had a regular um, pulse rhythm, it would just be consistent. It would be that bump, 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 bump. Okay, it would that's exactly how it would sound and how it would feel. If you have someone that's irregular, you might get three pulses and then a pause and then two more quick ones and then one. It won't be regular, okay? And we describe that as regular or irregular. A patient that has an arrhythmia is what we, is a pulse with an irregular rhythm. That's exactly what we call it. So an irregular rhythm is called an arrhythmia. Um, it may consist of random irregular beats and it may be a predictable pattern of irregular beats. So maybe it will be irregular, but very consistent. So three um, beats in a row, followed by a pause, two more, three regular beats in a row, followed by a pause, two more. That's what we call a regularly irregular um, pulse rate. So then we have the pulse strength, and we just talked about that in the previous slide. So this is, the pulse strength or the force, it reflects the volume of blood that's ejected from the heart against the arterial wall with each contraction, okay? And the condition of the arterial vascular system. And we just went over how we would describe them. So zero, plus one, plus two, or plus three. So very, there are variations in normal pulse rate by age. So all of your vital signs are gonna vary depending on age. So as age increases, your rates decrease. So a newborn, when they're first born, it's 130 to 160. And boy, let me tell you, it is hard to count those heart rates and feel them. Um, I remember doing that in nursing school and it was always a challenge because they're so loud and they go so fast and they're squirming all over the place. Um, a one-year-old, you're going to find pulses between 90 and 140, so still pretty elevated, but normal. 
five to eight year old, they're gonna be right around 100. Then when you get to be about 10 years old, you're gonna have a range between 70 and 100. And then when you're a teenager, between 60 and 90. And then in adults, 60 to 100 is your normal finding. And that's what you guys are gonna be seeing um, you know, when working with adults, that's the normal number, 60 to 100. And then in the elderly, it can be, their normal can be around 70. So your heart rate rises, your heart rates rise and peak with inspiration, at the peak of inspiration, and then they slow down um, as you're expiring. So factors that affect um, your pulse rate. So many factors can affect both the heart rate and the volume. However, your compensatory mechanisms always attempt to maintain a sufficient supply of blood to your cells at all times. So for example, when the stroke volume decreases, such as when the blood volume is decreased because of a hemorrhage, the heart rate increases to try and maintain the same cardiac output. Okay, so does that make sense to you guys? If you're hemorrhaging and you're losing blood, okay, your heart rate says, oh no, I have to, my organs aren't getting perfused. There's not enough blood here. So the heart jumps in as a compensatory mechanism and says, I need to increase and I have to triple time the amount of blood that I can get out because we're losing blood, okay? So that's a compensatory mechanism. Um, so then conversely, if you have a physically fit athlete, whose heart pumps a maximum volume of blood per stroke, the heart rate may be at a lower age or below the range of normal, yet the body's um, cells still remain adequately supplies, supplied. So um, athletes always have lower pulses. You can always tell they're usually around 50, 52, 55. Um, so don't be surprised, you, you know, I can always tell when I get a younger person and their blood, you know, their pulse rate is low. And I say, are you an, an athlete? And they're like, yeah, I run or I work out and you can always tell. So let's see, when assessing a patient's pulse, you always want to consider what influences your pulse rate. So we talked about age, okay. Um, biological sex, because men are slightly lower than women. Um, physical activity, those exercise. Um, the exercisers who take good care of themselves, fever, okay? So you, when you have a fever, you have that peripheral vasodilation, which increases your um, risk, your, um, your heart rate. Um, medication use can change it, and then the presence of any kind of disease. So let's see what else do I wanna talk about with this? I don't think so, okay. All right, so as the heart rate increases, cardiac output usually also increases. Tachycardia, which is a rapid heart rate, actually decreases the filling time, which in turn decreases the stroke volume and your cardiac output. So an adult that has tachycardia when the pulse is 100 to 180 beats per minute. So why do you think that when the a heart, when the rate of the heart rate increases, um, the stroke volume and the cardiac filling time is decreased. Well, normally when we have the normal heart rate, there's a great um, nice squeeze on the heart and then it relaxes and then it lets a certain amount of blood in. Well, when it has to squeeze more often, like in the case of the patient that's hemorrhaging, it's squeezing quicker you're not getting as an effective squeeze, okay, in between each pump. So you're getting that squeeze, but it's much quicker and you're getting less blood. So that's why your stroke volume is decreased and your cardiac output is decreased. And in, and in turn, your organs aren't getting perfused as well because that's the decrease in circulating blood, okay? So in an adult, tachycardia, the rate you're gonna see is between 100 to 180. Uh, resting heart rate of between 60 and 100 beats per minute was developed in the 1950s and it's still accepted. However, some research has indicated now that tachycardia can range over 95, okay? Well, we don't use that in the hospital. 95 to 100 is still what we use. And then they consider bradycardia less than 50. But in our hospital setting, we still consider um, bradycardia between 50 and like 58. So tachycardia is an excessively fast heart rate. 
It's over 100 beats per minute in an adult. It can be caused by exercise, fever, heat exposure, acute pain. If you have a patient that just had surgery and they're having a high heart rate, you have to try and consider that the pain that they're in because pain has a big influence on the blood pressure and the heart rate. Hyperthyroidism, hypovolemic shock, and heart failure can all increase your heart rate and cause tachycardia. Medications like epinephrine and albuterol also increase your patient's heart rate. And then if you wanted to go to page 65, you can see box 25-3, and it will give you factors that lead to um, tachycardia if you want to check that out. So then we have bradycardia. So tachycardia is an increased heart rate. Bradycardia is a decreased heart rate. So using our nursing terminology, if that's how we were going to describe a patient to a doctor or another nurse, that is what we would say. That patient is tachycardic, they have an increased heart rate, or they're bradycardic, their heart rate is low. So bradycardia is a heart rate in adults less than 60. Factors that cause bradycardia are um, long-term physical fitness, we talked about that, hypothermia, um, vagal stimulation, so bearing down to have a bowel movement. So I can't tell you how many times in the hospital setting it's happened at home and they wound up coming to the hospital for it or it happens while they're in the hospital. Patients are on the toilet and they're grunting and bearing down to have a bowel movement and that vagal stimulation happens and they're laying on the floor. I hope that never ever happens to me because that to me is so embarrassing. Can you imagine having a bowel movement and then ending up on the floor and somebody has to come in and find you? But it is a physiological reaction and it does happen. So then certain medications we give, um, so digoxin, digoxin, which affects the heart, um, beta blockers like propanolol, metoprolol, you have your calcium channel blockers, all these medicines affect your, um, your heart rate. Okay, so factors affecting the pulse rate. So like we said earlier, digoxin is a medication we give and it has the effect of slowing the pulse rate. And then epinephrine is a medication that we give and it has the effect of increasing the pulse. And then in patients that have hypovolemia, the, that which is a low circulating volume of blood, um, you have an increased pulse. Because, like I said, that compensatory mechanism kicks in, so you don't have a lot of blood in your circulating volume and your, your um, organs are not getting properly perfused. So that compensatory mechanism says we need to pump harder and faster because we have to make more blood. So that's when you see that increase in pulse in the attempts to raise the blood pressure and the circulating volume. All right, so stress, right? We know that increases the heart rate. It increases your sympathetic response. Position changes, going from sitting to standing or from laying down to sitting, causes blood to pool, which causes low blood pressure, and it can increase your heart rate. And then any kind of impaired oxygenation will also have a profound effect on your heart rate. So speaking of oxygenation, we're going to move into respirations. So... The physio physiological responses that cause respiration are you have chemoreceptors that are in your carotid arteries and the aorta, which primarily monitor the carbon di dioxide levels of the blood. So raising carbon dioxide levels triggers the respiratory center of the brain to increase the respiratory rate, okay? And then the increased respiratory rate rids the body of the excess carbon dioxide. So respirations have both an autonomic and a voluntary control. So the process of respiration. So we have ventilation. Ventilation is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, which happens in the lungs. We measure ventilation with respiratory rate, rhythm, and depth. Inhalation is breathing in and exhalation is breathing out. Diffusion, diffusion is simply put as the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide that occurs between the alveoli and the red blood cells. You measure diffusion with your pulse oximetry, which is that little um, thing, I'll, we'll, we'll show you a picture of it that you put on the end of your finger, and that um, measures the exchange of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, okay? And then perfusion. So perfusion is the flow of red blood cells to and from the pulmonary capillaries. And we measure performance also, um, perfusion, I'm sorry, also with pulse oximetry. 
So rate and depth of breathing. So the rate and the um, how deep you breathe can change in response to your tissue's demands. It is controlled by the respiratory centers of the brain, okay? Um, these changes are caused by the inhibition or stimula stimulation of respiratory muscles by the respiratory centers. Um, activation of the respiratory centers occurs when impulses from those chemoreceptors located in the aortic arch and the carotid arteries um, be a stretch and irritant, they're called stretch and irritant receptors in the lungs, and then also via receptors in muscles and joints. Whenever there's an increase in carbon dioxide, which is the most um, powerful respiratory stimulant, it causes an increase in your respiratory depth and your rate. So, um, the, cere the cerebral cortex of the brain allows for voluntary control of breathing, such as when singing or playing a musical instrument and we just keep breathing on our own and we're really not even thinking about it. So mechanisms of respiration, we have four factors that control respiration. Our oxygen supply, okay, how much oxygen we're getting, removing CO CO2, um, homeostasis, and um, homeostasis stasis would be if the patient's dehydrated, okay, not enough circulating fluid. And then heat exchange, which would be fevers. So if we're, dehydrate, if we're dehydrated, our respirations are probably going to be increased. And if we have that fever, what did we say would happen with your heart rate when you had a fever? You would be increased. So in this case, your respirations would also be increased. You would be breathing much faster. So this here just gives you all the structures. This is kind of like a little review from your phys, um, anatomy and physiology. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. You can see this chart if you want. Um, this just goes over all the key structures of the respiratory system. So your bronchioli, your nasal cavities, your epiglottis, trachea, um, alveoli, the bronchi, the pharynx, and the lungs. So if you wanna go back and take a further look at this, you are welcome to do that. So then we want to talk about assessing respirations, okay? So we said breathing in is inspiration, breathing out is expiration. So when we breathe in, okay, the chest expands, the ribs expand, the diaphragm expands, and the diaphragm contracts when we breathe in. When we breathe out, the chest then contracts, the lungs contract, and then that diaphragm starts to relax. And these are how we measure it. So Normal respirations in an adult are 14 to 20 in one minute. So if you were going to count for using your wristwatch with a second hand, you would want to count for 30 seconds and then multiply that number times two. So you want a number between 14 or 20. That's what we consider normal. So what are the components of a respiratory assessment? What are we looking at? Are we just looking at the rate? No, we're looking at a whole bunch of different things. So we're going to look at the rate. We're going to look at the depth. Okay. We're going to look at the rhythm, the quality, and then the effectiveness. So when we look at rate, the number, we're looking at the number of full inspirations and expirations in one minute. Um, we, would, we determine this by observing the number of times that the client's chest rises and falls. Um, and the expected range, like we said, is 12 or 14 to 20. Um, how do you measure this? So in an adult, well, we're going to learn about this more when you do physical assessment, but I usually tend not to tell patients that I'm measuring it because when you tell someone that you're, they're watching your respirations, all of a sudden the patient starts paying attention to how they're breathing and it's not going to be their normal rate or rhythm. Um, so it's best not to even tell them that you're watching them. I just usually watch the chest rise and fall and I, um, you know, count with my watch. Or sometimes when I have my stethoscope and I'm listening to their heart rate, I will also just spend another 30 seconds there and listen to that actual breath coming in and out of the chest. So there's a couple different ways to do it. But like I said, we will spend more time on that when you get to physical assessment. So we're going to look at the rate. We're also going to look at the depth. Okay, so this is the amount of chest wall expansion that occurs with each breath. And altered depths would be... Um, 
extremely deep or shallow. So if you have a patient that maybe just had um, a back surgery or an abdominal surgery, what type of breaths may you see in someone that's had some type of issue with their chest, their back, or their stomach? Well, you would expect probably shallow because it might hurt, right, to take that deep breath or that even just that normal breath. Or if they're not doing well um, and their, you know, their vital signs are declining and the patient's decompensating, you may see very shallow respirations, okay, which could indicate maybe the end of life. Or if they're taking very deep ones, then they're also having an issue breathing and they're trying to take as much deep breaths and get in as much air as they can. So then we're going to look at rhythm. So we're going to observe the breathing interval. So for adults, we would expect a regular rhythm, okay? We, and a regular rhythm, in our nursing words, is called eupnea. Um, eupnea is a regular rhythm, and occasionally you may have a sigh. So if you ever just, you know, look around at your parents or whoever you live with and just check out that normal rhythm, it occurs just like it should. There's no deviation. Um, it's a good rate and a good rhythm. Quality, what does it sound like when they're breathing? Is it an effort for them to breathe? Are they using accessory muscles? Can you see their chest, um, you know, rising and falling rapidly? Can you see their um, collarbones and their shoulders going up when they're breathing? Um, are they making any sounds? Do you hear gurgling? Do you hear crackles, advantageous lung sounds, wheezing? What are you hearing when they're breathing? So that's the quality. And then we wanna measure the effectiveness. So how effective is their breathing? Is there an uptake, a good uptake of oxygen and transportation of O2? And is there good transportation and ultimately elimination of CO2? So rate, depth, rhythm, quality, and effectiveness. Those are all the things we're gonna to use to measure our respirations. So then breathing patterns. So more nursing words. So apnea is the absence of breaths, okay? No air circulating, no breath happening at all. Eupnea, we just said, is your normal respirations. Tachypnea is abnormally fast respirations, so greater than 24 beats per minute, and usually they're gonna be shallow. And why do you think that they're shallow? Well, they're shallow because you're not getting that normal, normal breathing in and breathing out. You're breathing quicker, you know, much quicker. So you're like, so you, they're gonna be more shallow. They're not gonna be that great, um, you know, inhale of air and get that big bulk of, um, you know, air flow through the lungs. You'll see tachypnea in patients with fevers if they have anxiety and they're having an anxiety attack. If you're exercising, of course, I think we can all relate to that. And then some respiratory disorders like COPD, things like that. Um, so bradyapnea is abnormally slow, resp um, slow respirations, less than 10 beats per minute. They can be regular, okay, but they will be less than 10. And this occurs when there's a depression of the respiratory center by medication. We could give somebody too much medication and like an overdose, or if there's any kind of brain damage that affects the respiratory pattern. All right, so now we're gonna talk about volume. So how much volume are you getting in when you breathe? So we have hyperventilation and hypoventilation. So hyperventilation is overexpansion of the lungs characterized by an increased rate and depth. So your breathing is gonna be rapid and you're gonna be taking deep breaths, okay? This is what you would see when someone is, um, they're exercising, if they're scared, um, if they have a condition called diabetic ketoacidosis or any other condition that causes an increase in that carbon dioxide and a decrease in oxygen in the blood, okay? It's going to increase the rate and the depth of your respirations, hyperventilation. Um, respiratory diseases such as acute pneumonia also cause um, tachypnea, that increased um, heart, your increased respirations, and then this hyperventilation. So then hypoventilation is the complete opposite of hyperventilation. So under expansion of the lungs, characterized by shallow respirations, decreased rate and depth, and they're gonna be irregular. So you might, an example of when you might see hypoventilation is in an overdose of narcotics, or if we give someone um, too much anesthesia, you know, anesthetics. 
And then just a little refresher from your AMP title, the normal title volume that you wanna see is 500 mLs of air. If you guys remember that from anatomy and physiology, taking it way back. All right, so breathing pattern. So, you know, when you look at your patient, you wanna just try to visualize and determine is or their breathing. Is it easy for them to breathe or are they putting out effort? So eupnea again, that normal breathing rate, like most of us are doing right now. Then dyspnea is when a patient is um, experiencing difficulty or labored breathing during which the patient feels short of breath. So in the nursing world, when we're giving report and we're talking about someone that's short of breath, we might say that they, are, um, they have dyspnea at rest or dyspnea um, with exertion. That's how we say it in the nursing world. So dyspnea at rest would mean when your patient's just sitting, not doing anything, they're short of breath. And then if they have dyspnea with exertion, that means that maybe they're okay when they're at rest, but once they start ambulating and moving, then they get short of breath. And then orthopnea is the ability to breathe only in an upright sitting or standing position. So you see this a lot of times with patients that have COPD. A lot of those patients tend to sleep in their chairs instead of in their beds because that's the only place that they can really actually breathe good. So talking about rhythm, an abnormal rhythm or breathing pattern will, would be what we call Shane Stokes respirations. So I usually see these in my hospice patients who unfortunately are not gonna be around much longer. So it's considered um, kind of like a waxing and waning of respirations. They go from very deep to very shallow. And sometimes there's even temporary cessation, I can't talk today, cessations of breathing. So I've had this happen many times where I go in and I check on my patient and you know, I might be in the room and I look at them and they take a, you know, a shallow breath and then I'm walking around doing things and then I look at them again and there's absolutely no breath. And I feel like my heart always stops a little bit, even though I know it's coming, you're really never prepared for it and you don't want to have to see someone, you know, lose their life. So I feel like it always catches me off guard. But then as soon as I think that they're not really here anymore and that they've passed away, all of a sudden they take another deep breath. So this is pretty common in patients who are passing away and we call that shame strokes so that's that rhythmic waxing and waning of respirations very deep to very shallow and then definitely having periods of um, apnea no breathing at all so you see these in drug overdoses heart failure um, increased intracranial pressure and then again in renal failure all right so this diagram shows you on a waveform or a monitor what normal respirations look like. So you normal, you have their regular and comfortable of a rate of 12, for 20, 12 to 20. That's what we want all of our patients to have, okay? Um, Rhythmia is slower. You can see compared to the normal that it's much slower and it's less than 12 a minute. Then you have um, tachypnea, which you can see the difference between all three of those faster than 20 breaths per minute. And then you have, um, your hyperventilation, which is also faster than 20 breaths per minute, and you have some deep breathing going on. Then you have sighing, which is just, you know, frequently interspersed deep breathing. Um, Kussmaul's respirations, they're rapid, deep, and labored. There's those um, Shane Stokes that we were talking about. So you have your varying periods of increasing depth um, and shallow breaths. And then you see that flat line, that's that period of apnea where there's no breathing going on at all. And then air trapping, which is um, just an increased difficulty in getting breath out. And then biot, I've never even really seen that in a patient, but it's irregularly interspersed periods of apnea in a disorganized sequence of breaths. And then you have ataxic, which is significant disorganization with irregular and varying depths of respiration. So if you wanted to see this table again, it is in your book, page 658, table 25 uh, slash five, um, patterns of respiration. So alterations in respiratory function. What are our patients gonna look like if they are you know, air hungry or their respiration 
um, system is not functioning properly. What are we gonna see? What are the signs of hypoxia? So restlessness, they might, you know, they just might not be able to sit still. They might be telling you something doesn't feel right. I don't feel right. They might have like an impending um, feeling of doom. I've heard patients describe it as that. Um, loss of ox oxygen also will, when you don't get enough oxygen to the brain, can cause you to become agitated and confusion. So I remember one time when I was first off of orientation, I had a patient, an older patient who had pneumonia, and he was completely fine all day long, um, completely alert and oriented times four. And then his wife had called me later in the afternoon and she was like, there's something wrong with my husband. He is severely confused. He didn't know who I was on the phone. He didn't know who our children were. And I'm like, that's really weird. This, you know, this guy was just like a middle aged adult, not very old. And I'm like, okay, let me go take a look at him. So when I go in, he doesn't have his oxygen anymore, which he needed because he was on several liters. So as soon as I put that oxygen on and I gave him like 10 minutes, sure enough, he came around and he was completely alert and oriented again. So not having oxygen to the brain definitely alters your mental status and causes that confusion. Um, you also might see lightheadedness, okay, which can also cause mental status changes. You're going to see that rapid, shallow respirations and that dyspnea, okay, when they get short of breath. You might see nasal flaring as they're trying to get that air in you can see that substernal or intercostal retractions. And then a late sign is gonna be that cyanosis. And that's, you don't really wanna see that. You wanna try and intervene before it gets to that point. All right, so assessing blood pressure. So we've done pulse, we've done respirations. Now we're going over to blood pressure. So blood pressure, refers to the force of the moving blood up against the arterial walls. The pressure rises as the ventricle contracts, okay, we call that systole, and then it falls as the heart relaxes, um, which we call diastole. You guys should remember this from your AMP. The con this continuous contraction and relaxation of the left ventricle of the heart creates a pressure wave that's transmitted through the arterial system. The highest pressure is created during that ventricular contraction, which is again, what we call the systolic pressure. And when the heart rests between beats is the ventricular diastole and then the pressure drops. The lowest point pressure present on the arterial walls at this time is gonna be called that diastolic pressure. And the difference between systolic and diastolic pressures is called the pulse pressure. So the principal determinants of blood pressure are your cardiac output, how much is your heart putting out, and systemic vascular resistance. So blood pressure equals CO, cardiac output, times your systemic vascular resistance. Cardiac output is determined by the heart rate, how fast or slow it's beating, the contractility, how much of a good squeeze that heart is putting out, the blood volume, and then the venous return. So how much blood are you putting out and how much is coming back to that right side of the heart. Um, it increases in any of these, an increase in any of these increases your cardiac output and your blood pressure. Your SVR reflects the, your systemic back vascular resistance, reflects the amount of constriction of dilation of the arteries and your diameter of blood vessels. Increases in SVR ultimately increase blood pressure. Okay, does that make sense? So, Cardiac output is determined by heart rate, contractility, blood volume, and venous return. Increases in any of these are gonna increase your cardiac output and blood pressure. Your systemic vascular resistance, okay, your peripheral resistance, reflects the amount of constriction of dilation of the arteries and the diameter of blood vessels. And increases in SVR also increase your blood pressure. So your systolic pressure, again, to review, is the maximum pressure felt on an artery during that left ventricular contraction in the heart. That's your systole. Your diastolic pressure is that elastic recoil when the, you're, you're resting, when the heart is resting between contractions. Your pulse pressure is the difference between your systolic blood pressure and your diastolic pressure. Um, 
So 70 over 100 would give you a pulse pressure of 70. And then your mean arterial pressure is the force, the pressure forcing blood into your tissues over the cardiac cycle. So we call that MAP. It's, that's how it's referred to in the hospital setting or the healthcare setting. We call it mean arterial pressure, MAP, MAP. It's defined as the average pressure in a patient's arteries during one cardiac cycle. And it's considered a better indicator, actually, of perfusion to all the vital organs than your systolic blood pressure. So when your patients are in the ICU and things like that, they're really monitoring that MAP. They are monitoring the blood pressure, but they're really looking out for that MAP number because that's what determines how well your organs are being perfused. So when we measure blood pressure, we're going to use um, we're going to use a blood pressure cuff or a think mom no manometer. There's that word again, and a stethoscope. Um, your blood pressure cuff can be electric or a manual blood pressure cuff. I think manual blood pressure cuffs are much more accurate. So in the clinical setting, if you ever use your, and I use the electronic ones all the time, but if I get a value that I don't think is right or that is expected, and I have to base my decision of whether I wanna give medication or something like that, I will always follow up with a manual because that's the most accurate. And I wanna be able to go to the doctor and say, hey, look, I checked Mrs. Chen's blood pressure with a manual blood pressure cuff. She's still 90 over 60. I think we need to hold this med. So manual blood pressure cuffs, always more accurate. You want to always make sure you're using the right cuff size. So the width should be 40% of the comforts of the extremity that you're choosing to use. Okay. Um, it's essential to obtain an accurate blood pressure that you have the correct size. So the correct cuff should have a bladder length that is at least 80% of the arm circumference and the width that is at least 40% of the arm circumference. If the cuff is too narrow, the reading could be erroneously high because the pressure is not evenly transmitted to the artery. And if the cuff is too wide, like if, so an example is if you would use an adult cuff on the arm of a child, the reading can be erroneously low because pressure is dispersed over a disproportionately large surface area. Um, when you put that blood pressure cuff on, there are snaps, hooks, or Velcro that will hold it into place while you're measuring the blood pressure. And if you have a patient that has a latex allergy, we do have latex-free um, blood pressure cuffs that are always available that you can use. So, nursing alert. You do not want to use a client's arm for a blood pressure measurement if it's compromised in any way. So. You don't want to use the arm if the client has a vascular access for dialysis, if they have a stent or a, vis a fistula, um, if they've had a recent mastectomy. So when it, let me just backtrack a little. When a patient comes in, if they have what we call a restricted extremity, we usually have, and I'm sure the colors might be different through each hospital or facility, but ours are pink, and they say restricted extremity. So if I have a patient that goes to dialysis, and I know in their left arm they have a stent or a fistula, I'm going to get a brace. Slit, but I'm going to put it on that extremity so when um, techs come in or other nurses come in to draw labs um, or whatever they need to do blood pressures you see that on the hand and you don't use it and then I also put a sign at the head of the bed and then one at the front door as uh, on their main door to their room as well so if a patient had a recent mastectomy they are always at risk to having I'm sorry, lymphedemia, which means that that extremity swells. So if you had a patient that had an extremity, I mean, a mastectomy, they're always going to have one extremity that they won't be able to use, okay? So you would do the same thing. Always put that bracelet on and always put a sign. That's also something you would want to communicate in your report that they have no left arm, no procedures. Um, if they have a splint or a cast, you're not going to want to do um, a blood pressure on that arm because you don't want to injure it even further and then you're probably not going to get a good reading. And then if the patient has an IV, you wouldn't want to put a blood pressure cuff right over top the patient's IV because it could hurt the arm and then ultimately um, the stability of the IV and they might end up uh, needing another IV. So if any of these situations exist, you want to use the other arm. If both arms are unavailable, it does happen. Not seen a lot, but it does happen. You can use an alternative site such as the leg, um, you could even use, if you can't use the, the top of the arms, you could use the lower part of the arm, um, but I have seen them use the legs. Not often, but I have seen it done.
All right, so now we're gonna talk about cortical sounds. So these are the sounds that we hear when we're assessing the blood pressure with that manual cuff and our um, stethoscope. So the cortical sounds, there are five phases to assessing a blood pressure. So the first phase is when we pump up that um, cuff, it's characterized by the very first appearance of faint but clear tapping sounds that gradually increase in intensity. So the first tapping sound that you hear is the systolic pressure, okay? Blood flow is interrupted by the inflated cuff. And this is gonna make a lot more sense to you when we start doing our physical assessment, okay? We're just trying to get the terminology and get you a little bit of understanding about what's going on. Phase two is characterized by kind of like a muffled or a swishing sound. Um, these sounds may temporarily disappear, especially like in a hypertensive person. The disappearance of the sound during the later phase of one and during phase two is called the osculatory gap. And that may cover a range of as much as 40 mm's. Failing to recognize this gap may cause a series, um, a serious error in underestimating the systolic pressure and overestimating the diastolic pressure. As the pressure of the cuff is released, blood flow starts flowing again and the cortical sounds are audible. So when you get to phase three, it is characterized by distinct loud sounds as the blood flow relative, I cannot talk today, the blood flows relatively um, freely through an increasingly open artery. You get to phase four, it's characterized by a distinct, abrupt, muffled sound with a soft, blowing quality. And in adults, it, the onset of this phase is considered to be the first diastolic pressure. Then lastly, phase five, the silence that you hear. So the last sound heard before a period of continuous silence is the pressure at which the last sound is heard is the second diastolic pressure. So you're gonna pump up that cuff I know it's hard to explain. It'll all come together when you do it. Um, you'll hear some soft tapping and then some swishing or blowing, and then you might hear a thump, okay? And then you're gonna hear a bump, bump, bump. And wherever you hear that first bump, 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 whatever number you're at, that's gonna be your diastolic pressure. And then it's gonna fade, 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 fade. And whenever you hear no, that very last sound and it goes to silence, you'll look at your little, um, blood pressure cuff um, again, and whatever number you're on, is gonna be your diastolic number. But like I said, we're gonna go over more of that again in your physical assessment. So common errors in assessing blood pressure. So if your patients aren't um, positioned correctly, you can get a false high when you're doing your blood pressure. So if the arm is unsupported, if they're just holding it up, um, if there's insufficient rest before the assessment, so if they've been walking with um, PT or OT and they're sweating, you might not want to check their blood pressure at that time unless it's PT and you know you want they always monitor their blood pressure but you might want to give them a minute to rest if you if it's you're determining their blood pressure to give them a medication you might want not want to do it as soon you know as soon as they come back from running up and down the hallway we said earlier a couple slides back if the cuff is wrapped too loosely or deflating the cuff too loosely you're going to get abnormal readings um, assessing it after a meal can sometimes cause your blood pressure to be high. If the patient smokes, their blood pressure can be high. If they're in pain, you know, like we said, that heart rate's going to be up, but the blood pressure is also going to be up. And if your patient is anxious, they can also have an anxiety attack. And also if their legs are crossed. You don't want their legs crossed because that can also um, give you an abnormal reading. All right, so if the cuff is too wide, abnormal readings. If you repeat the assessment too quickly, that can also cause an um, impaired reading. If you deflate the cuff too quickly, you're also not gonna get an accurate reading. If your arm is above the level of the heart, or if your patient's legs are crossed, all are gonna give you abnormal readings. All right, so what kind of factors affect one's blood pressure? So age has an impact. impact. Your infants always tend to have a lower blood pressure. And with adults, they tend to increase with age. Exercise can decrease blood pressure for several hours afterwards. Stress, so fear, emotional strain, acute pain, all gonna increase that blood pressure level. 
race has an effect. So African Americans and Hispanics have a higher incidence of hypertension in general, and they occur at earlier ages in life. Women, um, gender has an effect. Women tend to have lower blood pressures. Obesity is a major contribu um, contributing factor to hypertension. Certain disease processes can increase your blood pressure, and then different variations of diseases can also increase your blood pressure. There are more you can read about on page 660 of your Taylor book. Box 25.5 is factors contributing to blood pressure issues. You can read that. And then we have physiological factors that control your blood pressure. So your cardiac output. If you're circulating volume, if the amount of blood that you put out from your heart is not sufficient, well, your blood pressure is not going to be high. Your blood pressure is going to be low. If you have peripheral vascular resistance, which is hardening of the arteries or what we see in hypertension, um, your blood pressure can be higher. Um, volume of circulating blood, again, your blood pressure is going to be lower. If your blood viscosity is very thick, it's not going to circulate as well, so your blood pressure can be lower. Um, your blood pressure can also be lower if it meets that um, peripheral vascular resistance. If it's meeting a lot of resistance, you're not going to get as much through. And then the elasticity of blood vessels can also um, have an impairment on your blood pressure. So. Consistent dielastic, dielastic, I cannot talk today, I don't know what happened to me. Consistent diastolic readings greater than 80 and systolic readings greater than 130 are considered hypertension. So they're often asymptomatic. They don't always have symptoms. Um, it is associated with thickening and the loss of elasticity in the arterial walls. So you can look at this little um, diagram that we have right here. We have normal pressure. Look at all that blood going through there. You have a nice width. It's nice and dilated. That's the arterial wall. Then if you look at the second one, not as much blood going through. You got a lot of buildup there. So you don't have as big of an area to get all that blood through, okay? And then you have high pressure. So if you have plaque in your arteries, that blood has to work harder. And the pressure has to come higher to get through that area where that plaque is. And hypertension is a, the major risk factor for a stroke. Um, so that's something you're going to want to educate your patients about. They're at a high risk for having a stroke if they have uncontrolled high blood pressure. Okay, so we said that the parameters are 80 for diastolic, a 130 for syst um, systolic. So these parameters were actually updated in 2017 to reflect a lower definition of high blood pressure because they were trying to account for complications that can occur at lower numbers and allow for earlier interventions. So it used to be, you know, um, 90 over 140. Well, now they've lowered it because they want people to recognize these abnormalities sooner and get interventions, okay? So they can try and control that hypertension. Um, let's see, hypertension is often called the silent killer because there's few symptoms, okay? Beyond the increased blood pressure, some people will say they're having headaches. Um, that is a known side effect of hyper, uh, hypertension. If my patient's tell me that in the hospital, that's one of the first things I do is check their blood pressure. All right, so hypertension risk factors. So we have two sets of risk factors. We have non-modifiable and then modifiable. So non-modifiable are things that we have no control over. No matter how hard we try, if we fall under this category and we suffer from this risk factor, there's nothing we can do to change it. Modifiable are things that cause hypertension, but we have an effect on. We can somehow um, change what's going on in our lifestyle to not have hypertension. So our non-modifiable risk factors are a family history of cardiovascular disease in women less than 65 or men less than 55. So you can't change your family history of cardiac disease and you can't change if you're a woman on a man or a man, so it's non-modifiable. Um, greater than the age of 60, can't change that. And then race. So we said African Americans and also Hispanics, and you can't change your race. So they are all non modifiable. Then we have modifiable, which is obesity. We can change obesity. We can exercise and we can lose weight and we can watch our diet, okay? Cigarette smoking. We do not have to smoke cigarettes. We can choose to quit or choose to never start. 
alcohol consumption, we can watch how much alcohol we consume or not consume any. High sodium intake, we can eat a whole diet with um, fresh whole foods. We don't wanna have added salt in our diet, so we don't wanna eat things that come in boxes or that have a lot of preservatives. Um, we don't wanna add salt to our diet. Sedentary lifestyles, we don't have to be sedentary. We can exercise three days a week or more, at least 45 minutes a day. Stress, it is modifiable. Not ideal, we always have some type of stress in our life, but it is modifiable, so if you have a really stressful job that's causing your blood pressure to go up, then you need to change jobs. So it is modifiable. And then type two diabetes. So we know that type two diabetes comes from being obese and being sedentary. So we can change those two things and ultimately change the fact of whether or not we keep, you know, having type two diabetes. So hypotension. So hypo, if hypertension is high blood pressure, what do you think hypotension is? Exactly right, it is low blood pressure. So hypotension occurs primarily as a result of the body's inability to control mechanisms to maintain or return blood pressure back to normal or the ability to do it quick enough. So pathologic hypotension might result from um, vasodilation of the arterioles and failure of the heart to function as an effective pump or loss of blood volume, which would come like as if you, your patient had a hemorrhage. A consistently low blood pressure is normal in some adults with no signs or symptoms. Um, hypotension is a medical concern if it causes signs or symptoms or is linked to a disease or health process. So hypotension, it can be normal. I always have hypotension. My blood pressure is always like 98 over 62 or 98 over 52, it's always low. But I don't have any signs or symptoms. I'm not dizzy, my heart rate isn't increased. I don't have any of the problems that go along with that, so it's okay. So you need to think about these things when you're treating your patients because you know, you might take a blood pressure on a patient and you might start to panic and think, oh my God, their, their blood pressure is 98 over 60. What are we going to do? Well, if your patient's sitting there comfortably, they're not dizzy when they stand up, their heart rate isn't increased, they don't have headaches or report any other side effects, then that can be completely normal for them. So you always want to treat the patient, not always that value that you get if they're not exhibiting, um, exhibiting any symptoms. So a blood pressure that is below normal, we consider a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or below, okay? We consider that hypotension. Then we have orthostatic hypertension, hypotension. So it's also called um, postural hypotension. And what that is, it's a decrease in your systolic blood pressure of less than 20 or a decrease in your diastolic blood pressure less than 10 within three minutes of standing when compared with blood pressures from sitting or in the supine position. So what you would do if you were um, asked to assess, doctors ask them all the time, get a set of orthostatic vitals. So you have your patient lay completely supine on the bed, you check their blood pressure, you write down the values. Within three minutes, you have them sit, when they're sitting at the end of the bed, you check their blood pressure again. And then finally after that, within three minutes, you have them stand, repeat their blood pressure again, and write down the numbers. If there's a change of 20 in that systolic number between all three of those checks, or greater than or equal to 10 within that diastolic number, then your patient has orthostatic hypotension. So, some people have it, it can be an acute issue, or they may have it chronically, they always have it. They can be symptomatic or asymptomatic, but it's usually associated with symptoms. So usually when those patients are changing positions, they get dizzy, they have lightheadedness, they might have blurred vision, they might feel weak, they might have fatigue, um, some people get nauseated, they might feel heart palpitations, and sometimes they have a headache from that volume moving so quickly. Um, Peripheral vasodilation is caused when the blood leaves the brain and moves to the periphery. And that can also cause, um, when that happens quickly, all the side effects that we just talked about. You can get hypotension from medications, from, you know, if you give your patient um, their blood pressure medicine, 
and their blood pressure was already too low, it can drop it even more, okay? Or if it's a new medication, it can drop it too quickly. Um, if you're bleeding and you're, hemorrh you're um, hemorrhaging, that's gonna cause that circulating volume to be low, so you're gonna have hypotension. Burns and then dehydration is gonna cause hypotension as well. So if you have the patient that is exhibiting orthostatic hypertension, hypotension, what do you want to tell them? You want to keep them safe, right? Because we know that they can be dizzy and lightheadedness. We don't want them to fall. We want them to know what to do when they go home. If they're going home and they, you know, we haven't done anything to correct it. So you want to instruct that client to get up slowly, right? From the lying or the sitting position and they want to avoid sudden changes in position, okay? So you always want to have some good education. All right, so now we are moving on to oxygen saturation. So how do we measure the oxygen saturation in our bodies? Well, the main thing we can do is we wanna use a pulse oximeter. This is a non-invasive, indirect measurement of the oxygen saturation, our SAO2, of the blood. It's the percentage of hemoglobin that is bound with oxygen in the arteries and is present in the, of, um, is the percent of saturation in the hemoglobin. You attached the sensor to the client's finger. You can attach it to their toe. You can attach it to their nose. I've never seen that done. Um, or the forehead or even the earlobe. I've done the finger and the toe and I've done the earlobe or around the hand or the foot of a neonate, say, neonate so infants are different. Um, something to think about with that is your patients that come in that have um, fake fingernails on or nail polish, that does make it a little bit more difficult. So you might have to take the fingernail polish off. Obviously you can't remove their false fingernails, but you can always take the fingernail polish off. So that's something to think about if you're not getting good readings, you wanna think about, hey, let me take a look at their nails. Um, so normal O2 levels are between 92 and 100. Less than 70% is life-threatening. If it's in the 80s, you're gonna to wanna to think, what do I need to do because this isn't a good number. We need to implement something to get their oxygen back up, okay? Um, their pulse oximeter will detect hypox hypoxemia before clinical signs and symptoms manifest, okay? So it is a great indicator of oxygen saturation. So it utilizes the light absorption characteristics of hemoglobin. So there is a color difference between arterial hemoglobin that is saturated with oxygen, which is bright red, okay? And then your venous hemoglobin without oxygen is darker. So it, it recognizes the color difference. It uses a pulsatile nature of blood flow in the arteries to aid in determining the oxygenation status of the body. With each heartbeat that the patient has, there's a very slight increase in the volume of blood flowing through the arteries that's causing an associated increase in oxygen-rich hemoglobin. This represents the maximum amount of oxygen, the rich hemoglobin pulsating through the blood vessels. So what does all of this mean about oxygen saturation? So oxygen is in the air, right? It's in the air that we breathe into our lungs. We breathe air into our lungs, the oxygen then passes into the blood, okay, where the majority of the oxygen attached to the hemoglobin is transported into the bloodstream. So hemoglobin is the oxygen carrying protein that we find in red blood cells. We breathe the, air, the oxygen, through the air into our lungs, and then that oxygen is passed into the blood where the majority of the oxygen is attached to the hemoglobin. The oxygenated blood circulates to the tissues and gives it proper perfusion, right? Because we're getting all that oxygen-rich blood to all those organs. That's why the probe is placed on the extremities, okay? So that we can determine the delivery of oxygenated blood to the peripheral tissues, our fingers, our toes, our ears. It's an indicator of that peripheral oxygenation. An infant has a probe taped to the large toe. Um, I am not completely sure about that um, because I've never worked with infants other than in my clinical setting. And I do believe now that I think about it, it was on their toe, but that's where it would be for an infant. And decreases in O2 saturations. Um, if you're not getting good numbers, you can always put it on the earlobe and it is more accurate. And I've had to do that multiple times for my patients and it does work well. 
All right, so oxygen saturation, what are some factors that affect our oxygen readings? Our hemoglobin level. So we know that hemoglobin carries oxygen rich blood, right? So if we don't have adequate hemoglobin levels, we're not gonna have adequate oxygenation um, throughout our body, okay? So your hemoglobin level determines your oxygenation. Your circulation, how much is circulating? How much blood do you have circulating? If you're hemorrhaging and you don't have a lot of blood circulating, you're not gonna get enough oxygen throughout your body. Um, certain activities, and then if you have carbon dioxide poisoning, so you're not gonna get rid of that carbon dioxide, it's gonna build up, and that is in turn going to prevent um, your body from being properly oxygenated. So that is the end of vital signs. And next, we are going to be moving on to comfort and hygiene, and then we're gonna do safety. And if you have any questions, we will talk about this when we have our live lecture together.